Grab your minimalist artwork, Wargamers, because today we are zooming down to a very simple thought exercise that will help us to understand how things work in Rod Humble's 2x2 Napoleonics. I've played, man, what are we going on, like 10 games of this so far, and I'm still kind of struggling with the ramifications of how to deal with the way this rule set is written. So, to help me wrap my head around how to think about it, I thought it would be worthwhile to go through a little intellectual exercise. And I like you guys. Oh, I'm going to replace these. Those are grenadiers. I want to use line versus line. In this case, we're looking at irregular miniatures, two millimeter figures. Each of these represents a regiment. And in the campaign games that I use, it's for imaginations. These are 750 men, 750 horse. Yeah, those numbers are probably wrong. If they are, how many horse should this be? If a regiment of infantry is 750 men, how big would you expect horses to be? I can't find a straight answer anywhere. Because everybody wants to tell, they want to answer like bridge players. You ever play, you ever learn, try to learn how to play bridge from a bridge player? Oh my goodness. They like to tell you a rule, and then they tell you the 80 ways that you will never do this thing because of all of this intricate strategy, and you're like, dude, can you just tell me the rules? If I make the mistake once, I won't make it again, I promise. Just tell me the rules. Anyway, we're going to look at this little rant over, we're going to look at this little exercise here. So the thing with 2x2 two two Napoleonics is that it has a bit of a stutter step, I go, you go system. Essentially what happens is, and this is going to be player one, this is going to be player two. Player one is the defender and goes first. Player two is the attacker and goes second in every turn. So the way the game works, player one moves and then they rally their unit. Then player two shoots and then you do melee, if any. Then player two moves, player one shoots. Well, excuse me. They move, they rally, then they shoot, and then we do melee one more time. Okay, you get it? So basically, move, shoot, move, shoot. Which means, if you have the initiative, I should say, if you're the phasing player, you can move six inches. So I'm going to pull these guys apart so they are now six inches apart. Are you with me? If he wants to attack him, he can move three inches and then he's done. So then he has to move. And the question becomes, well, if, if he's on the defensive, what does that mean? Well, he's, he can't shoot yet because he's too far away. So we did move and then he says, I'm not going to shoot. Are you going to move? Well, if he moves up to here, then he gets to take the first shot, which makes sense, right? But now that he has shot, whatever the result is, he's going to have to wait to determine whether, oh, I just figured it out. This right here is the key. So he moved... And then he moved. Now, if he shoots, he is pinned. And on the next turn, maybe he rallies and maybe he doesn't. But he has to do his movement first and then rally, assuming he does. After that, now he gets to decide, do I want to shoot? And look, now I got to just sit there. Or do I want to move into contact? And remember that in this game, when you're pinned, you can keep shooting all the live long day. The only thing you can't do is move. So if he shoots and he's pinned and he doesn't rally, after you rally, you have to forego shooting when you are within charge range. Maybe he's two inches away. And he says, maybe he's pinned, right? Maybe he shot it at, at some horses. Oh, so maybe he shot at some horses and the horses ran away. And now he's only two inches away. So he has the option. Do I move up to here and let him fire at me and then return fire? So what does that mean strategically? It means if you are assaulting a position, you're going to have to weather at least one storm of gunfire, and then you're going to decide whether or not you want to stick around. All right. 
Good to know. So we figured that out. The other issue is what happens when a cavalry, and this is a light cavalry, mind you. See? Light cav. You can tell because they're all spread out. When you watch my vidjas, if you see cavalry that are, they are painted exactly the same, but you see the heavy cavalry, they're all jammed up tight. So if they're spread out in loose formation, it's light. And if they're jammed up tight, they're in heavy. And I mentioned this distinction because this is where I need you guys' help. I was operating under the impression for both of my campaigns that light cavalry were cheaper and more prevalent on the battlefield than maybe they are. That really, because so if you look at the campaign that's ongoing right now, the White Queen's War, I've only got two heavy cavalry on both sides. All three armies, two heavy cavalry. Should I have a lot more heavy cavalry and a lot less light cavalry? If that's historical, would you, would you tell me? Because, again, every single Napoleonic scholar doesn't want to say, yeah, you know, general, generally speaking, light cavalry were of more use um, off the battlefield and heavy cavalry on. That'd be good to know. But most of them want to say, oh, well, you know, light cavalry were useful, except you also have dragoons who are kind of between light and heavy. And, oh, by the way, in addition to cuirassiers, you also had the... And these, and, and, these cuirass, and these heavy cavalry were called dragoons, even though they weren't dragoons, but it's because they were dragoons, and then when they stopped being dragoons, they still wanted to call themselves dragoons. The whole thing, is, it's really hard to get into this stuff because nobody wants to give you a straight answer. Except for my commenters. I have the best commenters. Top-notch. World-class people. So the other thing to be aware of now, with the, I think I kind of figured out one difference between light and heavy cavalry here. So if we look at the, the way the modifiers work here in 2x2 two two Napoleonics, uh, when it comes to shooting, yeah, cavalry can't do it. Uh, but, you know, if your target is cavalry, oh boy, how do you get that big plus two? And I should point out, when you shoot, uh, you really need a five any effect. So that plus two means suddenly a three-up is an effect. Oh, that's good. And pinning cavalry is great because it means you can get stuck in. Now, looking over here at the... Uh, honestly, it's the only way to catch them. They move four or five inches to foot pound, ground pounders three. So the only way to catch them is to pin them, right? Anyway, looking over here at the melee, what we're looking at here is if you've got a heavy cavalry, you're rolling a plus two. And this is a straight D6 roll-off. So that plus two is pretty impressive. Uh, I found in my experience that the plus two will often wind up being one plus two going up against a five or a six so you know your mileage may vary the other issue is uh if the enemy is disrupted and then if you're in melee with more than one unit so if you are flanking someone this is the other issue that i haven't been able to quite resolve in my head yet what if you have a situation where You've got a, these guys have moved up, and then they fired. Okay. And then uh, they were unable to recover in their next turn. So the next turn, these guys did manage, or maybe they started off this far away from each other. And maybe they moved up to here, and these guys, rather than waiting for a turn, said, oh, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and just contact. In fact, this is what I found happens more often than not, that two units two inches apart Rather than move up and risk getting run off, they'll just move to contact, and now they're in melee. So this is where cavalry comes into play, is these guys have a movement of five inches. So if they can come up, that gives these guys a plus one in melee. Now, I don't understand. We resolve the melee here. What do you do with this melee? And, oh man, you know, now that I look at this, I figured it out. So if you've got a melee that's operating here, they're at plus one, either they lose and these guys follow up and now they're clear of that flank attack. Oh, I guess it arrived too late. Right, remember that we're just modeling what may happen here. All of this is really happening in real time. So these guys are putting pressure on them, but maybe that battle is over and these guys were run off. So now it doesn't really matter, there's no battle. On the other hand, if our blue army wins, these guys are going to be destroyed or they're going to run away, and now you still don't have an issue. The only time where you might have one is where you win by one or two, in which case the loser routes. Uh, I'm sorry, one, two, or three, the loser router is destroyed, and then they have an optional follow-up. So they can turn to face, and now that attack is going to be at minus one for these guys because it's their second attack in the battle. 
So do they really want to stick around and fight these guys? Now, to be fair, light cavalry has a minus one, so this becomes pretty much an even die roll. But I would think that in any given case, you're probably going to take the the uh, the movement here and and follow up just to get clear of these guys. Because if you've done this on the opposite player's phasing turn, you know, in other words, this guy moved up to you and now you're doing melee here, you're going to get the next move order. So th you, you're going to get another melee out of this before this guy gets a chance to move. So that's another thing to consider that, you know, I don't think you really plan for that. I think that if you're in a situation where you've, you're being flanked like this, you know, whether you win or lose, it resolves itself. But the, the other thing is I'm talking about light cavalry. Now, what if this is a heavy cavalry? that's flanking you. Is that still only worth plus one? It looks like it is. So what you may want to do in that case, the moving player, he gets to decide. He would say, I'm going to bring to contact. Okay, cool. And then I'll bring this guy. So now my main combat is the heavy cavalry. And that's one of the things that this is helping me understand. Bring your big boy in first. Because now if you look at all the modifiers, you are looking at heavy cavalry plus two, uh, you've got an extra enemy in melee. He's at a total of plus three to this guy's straight die roll. So, you know, it, it, if you roll a four or better, he can't win. Which is the kind of position you want to put yourself in. Compared to here, where on a four or better, you automatically win. Whereas here, the only way you win automatically is with a six. Right? Because that six becomes a seven, and he can't roll better than that. And again, the other thing to be aware of is that because the differential is so important, on a 1 or a 2, here we go, on a 1 or 2 differential, the loser routes. On a 4, the loser is destroyed. So, yet not only do you win, but you're a lot more likely to get that big 4-point spread and just destroy these guys outright. That's kind of a strategic rundown of what you're looking at. By the way, the other thing that I figured out a little bit late when you have, I'm going to drop a reinforcement point down. So this is now the edge of the battlefield. Oh, look out, regiment. So this is now the edge of the battlefield right here, okay? And uh, over here, waiting just off the table, the blue have a, a unit of heavy cavalry and a unit of grenadiers. And remember that these light cavalry aren't, aren't particularly useful. So one thing you can do is, if you've got, pull back up. If it's your turn to move, now they're four inches away. If they move to here on their turn, their movement phase, both of these units go bye-bye. So this light cavalry just fought a heavy cavalry to a draw. This big plus two Mamma Jamma just lost to a guy that gets minus one in all of their melee. So that's a, I mean, that's a basically a plus three that just went bye bye On the other hand... If you've got a light cavalry that's about to come in and these crazy Austrians here are marching by and they're about to put paid and just kind of slam up against these guys, if you're worried about losing them, when you bring on a unit, you can say to that anybody within three inches, hey, this light cavalry is gone and so is this guy. So now you've traded a line infantry for that cavalry more importantly, you've got this strategic situation where you're preserving this plus one versus a minus one, where before they were under threat. So that's the use of these light cavalry. Bear in mind that you have to be able to predict what order to bring the light cavalry in. You declare which units are coming in in which order before the battle starts. So you might not want, we'll put a grenadier here up, up front, right? If you said, I'm going to bring my grenadier and then my horses, you may be in a situation where you say, man, I, ooh, if I bring this guy on, maybe I just go ahead and contact. Because this is not a fair trade. These are, these are elite troops, and I would much rather try to fight these guys off and win outright, or maybe even just disrupt them so that these heavy cavalry can hit them when they're disrupted for another plus two. By the way, heavy cavalry hitting a disrupted unit, that's a plus four. 
You ain't losing that one, brother. So going back to the, re the reinforcement points, that's why these become so critical. There's not, you know, I tend to play by the seat of my pants. It's hard to predict what's going to happen out here. So you kind of say, well, I guess I'm going to bring my grenadiers in first. And, you know, no plan, like Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until it gets punched in the mouth. So you do the best you can with the tactics. And, you know, you may live to regret not bringing the light cavalry on first because now I'm trading a grenadier instead of light cavalry. But what can you do, right? Monday morning quarterback, and that's what you guys can do. You say, oh, yeah, you probably should have done X, Y, and Z. It's all right. I love hearing that stuff. Maybe I'll get it right next time. But this also leads to a situation where there's a bit of a cat and mouse for our, if this is, I'm going to clear everything off. It's going to look boring for a second. And I'm going to put down, you get three places to come on the board, right? Three for green and three for blue. And you start off, so we're going this way, right? And blue says, I'm putting the bulk of my army right here on the board. And green says, well, I'll match you for that. He plays first. He must be the defender. Now, the defender can only put his reinforcement points down here. Attacker can put him on any side he wants. So now the defender has to commit. Are you going to be bringing him in right behind? Are you going to bring over a flank attack? And if they do, that attacker can say, oh, man, you're coming in on that side? Great. I'm going to reinforce over here. I'm thinking you're going to go like this. But now, just by putting a threat there, you have to change your plan. You thought you were going to run right across, but you got to defend now. And, of course, you've got one more re reinforcement point, so you can say, okay, fine, I'll, I'll bring on an attachment here. But you may be sending your main force to defend this so that what you thought would be reinforcements can go hey diddle diddle. Of course, before that can happen, you got to remember that the attacker has one more place that he can reinforce. The only real advantage that you have as the defender is that reinforcing on the baseline, you come in on a three plus where it takes a four plus over here. So every three turns, right? Remember that it's gonna be, you get two chances. So every three turns, you're gonna roll six dice. So if you run the statistically speaking on average, you're going to get in four units to his three that ain't nothing statistically and you know you find where, where i use roads give you a plus one so that your reinforcing point your reinforcing troops coming on anything but a one it's astonishing how many ones i roll in that situation hey one more thing that a general has to deal with and of course maybe he decides you know i'm going to go ahead and just kind of linger back here and i'm going to dare you i'm going to dare you to get overextended up this way. So this is what I love about this particular 2x2 two two Napoleonic's rule set, is that this mini game that happens before the first die roll is rolled, it really directs the way battles go in some fundamental and elegant ways. And this little mini game is what makes this feel like a Napoleonic game. It makes it feel like you are commanding core level forces. You're not just assaulting a barn with a couple of squads. You're just you're not just attacking Foy with a platoon or two. You're handling the strategic front even before we deal with the tactics on the board. This is a free rule set. And it speaks volumes about what an incredible hobby we have here. That we have gotten, I've gotten 10 battles out of this, this old rule set. You know, I don't see a whole lot of people talking about it. I paid exactly $0 for it. There is no entertainment medium that gives you that level of return on your investment. Take a look. Do it right. Maybe you use, half, you're supposed to be using a half inch by one inch. I use a one by one because I'm fat fingered and, and I just, these are cheap and easy to use. But it still works. I think it works great. Um, so the two questions I have for you guys. Are, so that's, be aware of that as we go through the rest of the battles in this White Queen's War, that that's what we're looking at. Pay attention to how 
the strategic game impacts the tactical game. And pay attention to how placement of reinforcement points drives the action. Because it may be half the game. And I think I've mentioned in battle reports before, that's really what separated the the really effective generals from the guys whose names are lost to history. That they were able to see six moves ahead and know whether to order the reinforcements on here versus here. I'm not there. I'm just playing at being Napoleon and falling well short. There's no shame in that. I'm learning more all the time. I'm getting better all the time, and so are you. And one of the ways to get better is for you guys to tell me what I'm doing wrong, tell me what I'm doing right, tell me all this stuff. Comment section just down below. So look to see if I'm incorporating these lessons in the future. And in the future, in those battle reports, I'll see you in the comment section. Until then, I'm praying for you.